Hello there, this is Laura Alameri, and this is a quick podcast I want to do about real estate investing forecasts for 2020, and specifically, what does it mean for a real estate investor? Okay, so I've done a lot of research over the last few days, and I do this at the end of every year because I think it's important me as an investor to really position myself and know what is coming up, and uh, that's why I would like to share the information with you. And uh, um, so 2020 is going to be a really interesting year. Well, first of all, the good news is that real estate is still going to be very strong. Okay, unless uh, something happens that is unforeseen um, in the you know, in the world, um, in the economy, and uh, in society in general, that uh, we're still going to be riding the wave of uh, a strong real estate market. So, um, as uh, we're going to see the prices uh, staying this, uh, stabilizing, though, you know, we're not going to have see big jumps. And actually, in some parts of the country, we are going to see a little bit of a price decline. Uh, there are some markets that uh, Realtor.com has recognized that will be declining, uh, like San Francisco, South Florida, especially the Miami area, uh, St. Louis. And so there are some markets that are going to see some adjustments because they inflated a little too rapidly over the last two, three years. So the, that also means that the inventory, though, is going to also tighten up. And this is interesting because it's not tightening up um, for the reasons you might think, um, but it's because of the um, perceptions of people that are going to change and they're changing in society. So we have two main groups of people. We have the millennials and we have the baby boomers. Now, the millennials over the last few years, they were still on the fence as far as buying a house because they saw what happened to their parents 10, 12 years ago when the economy uh, went down, when the housing market went down. So they were on the fence line, they prefer renting. But over the last year or so, we have seen a confidence rising on the millennial side. Actually, 46% of purchases of homes over the last years were uh, from millennials. And uh, so they actually mention as purchasing a home, a priority for them over getting married or having children. So that's interesting to see that, that there is change in uh, their ment mentality about purchasing. The other side is the baby boomers. Um, the baby boomers are historically, they were actually downsizing, right? When they became empty nesters, when the children moved on. Now they don't, not as much. They're actually holding on to their residence as an investment and, um, and uh, they're purchasing a second home uh, for all the places that they want to live. So this is interesting, right? So we have the millennials coming in the market stronger than ever, and we have the baby boomers who are not really letting go of their residence. So that is what is causing some tightened inventory. And then we, the new construction is not keeping up with the demands. Okay, especially in certain markets, there is a lot of migration to certain markets around the country, uh, like in South Florida, for example, and the construction is not really keeping up with the demand. So uh, what does it mean for you as a real estate investor? So, okay, that's, where does it put me here? Well, I think that in 2020, the strategy that's going to be the strongest in real estate investing, the one that's really you're going to can make a lot of money is fix and flip um, because of the demand of housing. And also, there is another thing that's changing in society where 20 years ago, 30 years ago, there was this feeling of... Uh, you know, buying homes that were undervalued and putting sweat equity, fixing up the house uh, to, for the owner occupant. You know, the people didn't mind to buy a house that needed work before they moved in. Nowadays, um, they, it seems like everybody has less time and less patience to do this. You know, this is kind of how society has evolved. So people prefer, in general, buying homes that are already fixed up. They want turnkey. And with that said, 
uh, there's more demand for homes that are fixed up. So that's why the rehabbers, the people that are willing to go out there and fix up these homes, are really going to have an advantage. There is, they're really rehabilitating properties and put them on inventory, which is much needed. However, that also something you need to pay attention to, so as far as the inventory, is uh, the demand of what type of homes is actually going to be the strongest, right? And that's, I actually wrote a blog on my website, so please check it out. It goes into more there about what is the sweet spot in real estate investing. What is that range that you can't go wrong as a rehabber uh, to, to rehab a house and you know it will sell the quickest? And that's different for different areas, okay? It depends if you're on East Coast, West Coast, Midwest, but it's, different in each area. So you have to do some research there to find out what property ranges sell the fastest, less days on the market in your area. And you can get that from the MLS. Um, and also, you know, what are the FHA limits for the loans, right? Because FHA is a government subsidized type loan that is usually helping people, especially first time home buyer to purchase homes. So you have to pay attention to those uh, numbers because most people want to buy homes. The ones they're probably going to buy the most are in the FHA level or less, uh, are in the sweet spot, which changes for the, and it's not necessarily FHA for everybody, right? Because if we're talking about California, for example, um, you know, where there is a lot of money going in and out, it could be a different range, it could be a conventional or even a jumbo loan within a certain range to sell the best. So you have to really check in your area to see what the sweet spot is. So, you know, make sure you read the article on my uh, site. Um, so with that said, as a rehabber, you do your research and now you're gonna buy homes that you know you can resell within the sweet spot range and still make your profit. Now, as a wholesaler, you need to pay attention what the rehabbers are looking for, right? Because if the rehabber said that the, the range in your area is three to 400,000, the sweet spot, and you know that the rehabber has to sell the property for $400,000 or less, then you need to find homes that at the end of the day, when he resells it, he can make his own profit, which is 10, 15% of the final repair value. He has to deduct the repairs, a holding cost, and you have to make your profit as a wholesaler. So you have to do certain calculations to see how much you can actually put this property on the contract so you know there were sales for rehabbers. So there is definitely a use of wholesalers here in this market as well. And a lot of rehabbers, the people that are really heavily doing rehabs, they don't have the time or the patience to go look for deals. They prefer connecting with wholesalers who can bring the deals to them. And because they're putting their time and energy better spent in actually rehabbing the properties. So with wholesalers, you want to connect with rehabbers and you want to find out what they want, what price ranges, and you want to bring to them what will make sense for them which are within the sweet spot. So see how everything is kind of tied together. So this is a very interesting. And the other thing is that, um, now there is a range in population that they, you know, no matter what they can't afford, especially in high market, inflated markets like South Florida and California, where um, people, no matter what, they can't afford to get a loan, even FHA, they don't even have, you know, the 3% down payment and closing costs. They just don't have the money. They're still priced out of the market. The market actually squeezed them out. So what do they do? They want to rent. So again, now we go back to saying the rental market for the properties that actually people that cannot afford to buy, the range in rents for people that cannot afford to buy are going to be the highest in demand. Because at the end of the day, if somebody can buy, put a down payment and closing cost, you know, they might be better off buying. But there is a lot of population that's still looking to um, rent. Now, also in areas that are, um, like I said, exploding, uh, some like in Florida, where there is so many people moving down here all the time, the rent demand is really high. It's been high for several years now because a lot of people transient that are moving in the area see how they like it and then buy. I mean, I did the same thing. I moved to Florida four years ago and 
for the first two years, I rented. I just wanted to know the areas where I wanted to live. And then I bought my own residence. But the thing is, I didn't then jump into it right away, right? Because I wasn't really familiar where I really wanted to live. So there is a lot of uh, people that are moving in areas and they're trying to decide what they want to do. And so there is a lot of transience. I mean, American society is much more transient than Europeans are. Um, and so they tend to move, but because of the economy and what is going on, there is so much going on in different parts of the country, people move even more, but those are renting, okay? So you have these interesting things in the economy and society going on that you need to pay attention to because real estate is a dynamic business, okay? At the end of the day, it constantly changes, it evolves, people change and evolve, right? The perception, like I said, what the millennials are thinking, what the baby boomers are doing, you know, it's like a difference. Like I was looking the other day into statistics and um, golf courses, right? Um, people don't play, the millennials don't play much golf like their parents used to. So there are certain subdivisions by golf courses where you have to pay these golf course memberships and, uh, and they give the houses away for literally nothing. I've seen a house for sale for $10. They give the house away because people have to pay these memberships into the golf course and they don't want to, right? Because now I was telling everybody, I says these communities will have to restructure how they do business and, and how they allow people into the golf courses because the real estate is not gonna be valuable around these golf courses anymore. So it's because of society, how they change. So you always want to keep an eye on that as an investor because it can make totally a difference how you approach real estate. And this is very important to understand in this business, okay? Now, the other thing, and uh, I'm reading my notes here very quick, so that's why I'm, I'm looking over on the side. Um, the other thing is uh, technology. Uh, innovative platforms are entering real estate industry, right? So we've seen all kinds of tools and apps and different things coming in over the last few years. And, uh, you know, some are pretty good. Some are not impressive to me, but they're getting better. They're getting so much better. And, uh, you know, I foresee that in the next few years, we're going to see some revolutionary things done with technology and apps as it applies to real estate and also the reliability of this data that I really don't trust 100%. that comes from different type of technologies apps. However, right now, um, I'm still marrying some of the old school, old fashioned way of doing things with the new way of doing things. And I think as an investor, you have to be very careful with that because I, and an interesting thing somebody told me is they say, you know, we have all these new investors coming in over the last few years, you know, these younger guys that, and most of them are guys, some women, um, that are coming into the market and they get, go gung-ho into wholesale and so forth. And they are going to high level automation and this stuff like that. And, um, but the thing is, we haven't seen the longevity of how they conduct their business, okay? Are they gonna stick with the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years? Some like the old timers like me. And, and I think that as things have evolved, because I started in real estate back in the 80s before a um, lot of the technology. I mean, our first computer terminals, you know, we had the MLS and uh, even fax machines that we, didn't use fax machine until probably the beginning of the 90s. So before that, we had this weird telex type thing. So, you know, we, I've seen leaps and bounds in technology since the way I started. And, uh, but I've always been very careful about never taking the leap into something, you know, totally different. You know, they say if something works and it's not broken, you know, don't fix it. Right, so I've been very cautious of leaving what I know works for something else, even if there's promises that this thing might work better and faster. Yes and no. Um, so what I mean with that is that use some very common sense as far as how you approach technology. 
yes, there are leaps and bounds out there. Don't rely on it too much. Work on some old fashioned strategies. Um, don't rely too much on clicking a button and buying a list or of having other people making calls for you that you don't know who they are. You know, be very careful about the quality control of every step of the process. It is your business. Uh, it is your livelihood. It is your money. It is everything to you. And it's so important that you have a good control of every step of the way. So with that said, some apps, that some technology, use it. Cool. You know, you're not going to bank on it. But the thing is, move cautiously into it because it's not really the best thing out there yet. Okay. Um, so uh, see, see if I missed anything here. Oh, um, last thing I want to just kind of mention, there is money out there. There's so much money out there for real estate, okay? Um, private lenders, money partners, joint ventures, hard money. There's so much money. People are throwing money to, to get real estate, to buy real estate, to rehab, to buy and hold. I've never seen as much money out there circulating easily, especially in the private sector, the private lenders more than the banks. The banks obviously are regulated and they're still scared and the, the government is keeping a tight control on what they do because we don't want to have a 2007 again. But in the private sector, there's so much money out there. But the key is um, these private lenders want you to have some experience in the business. Okay. So you can go in with no experience if you have backing, financial backing, if you have IRAs, self-directed IRAs, 401ks, money, savings, any type of money, then that counts for the experience. But a lot of people that go into this business might be don't have that much money yet, or they have, you know, a limited supply. So my suggestion is that you go into strategies like wholesaling because it's not just about the money that you might be saving from doing some wholesale deals, but that counts as your experience. That builds up your resume as a real estate investor. And so when you go to a private lender, they're going to look at you differently. If you've done anywhere from three to five deals, that's the normal that they're requesting. They're going to look at you, give you more favorable rates, loan you a higher loan to value on the property, even go up to 100% financing in asset-based lending, meaning you don't have to have a job or income or nothing. They just want to see some experience. And the easiest way to do that is with wholesaling. So keep that in mind if you're in a position where you don't have that much capital or you don't have a job you really want to get going in the business. Okay. So hopefully this was good, some good highlights and recommendations. And uh, so go for it. 2020 is a great year in real estate. You can make a lot of money. You can position yourself very strongly before, you know, the next recession, speed bumps, hits. Always does. Every 10 to 15 years, we have enough to be scared about. I don't foresee it's going to be as big as 2007 because there is a lot more regulations and things in place to protect us from that but it's, something's going to happen. And don't be scared. As a real estate investor, as long as you keep an eye on what's going around you and uh, you keep an eye on the future and you position yourself in a way that you know what you're doing and you're not too overconfident or too risk much of a risk taker, you'll be fine. You'll just be fine and you're going to be thriving in the business um, for the next 30 years, 40, 50, you know? So great, hopefully this was helpful. Don't forget to check my website at uh, lauraalamiri.com. I have a ton of articles and webinars. And if you do wanna talk to me, uh, please do schedule a call. You will find links on my website to schedule calls with me. And uh, I have live events, retreat coming up. I always have a retreat at the beginning of the year, three day retreats where we actually get hands on on different type of training strategies. And I invite everybody from all over the country to spend three days with me working together. So thanks again. Have a great new year. Look forward to 2020 and I will talk to you soon. Goodbye.